Hello everyone. You're really welcome to the alternative to Skullnaglarsach 2020, the festival of early Irish harp which normally takes place each August in Kilkenny in Ireland. Between the 13th and 17th of August 2020, we'll be joining together each day to watch a talk, a workshop and concert footage from previous Skullina. Find out more on our website at irishharp.org. So here we are, Monday the 17th of August, and the final day of our Skull Naglarshirk Alternative for 2020. Thank you to all of you from around the world who have joined us each day. We hope you're safe and well, and we send you our best wishes from Kilkenny and from Ireland. Welcome to our final talk. So I know you'll have a really wonderful time listening to us, so please welcome her. not about the music. This would be more like the press releases you've sent out and what feedback you're getting in the magazines and the journals, what people are, t are saying about you, what the commentary is about the Harp Festival here this week, except we're going back in time 200 years. So it's not so much a discussion on the music, though that also exists on, in the periodicals. Um, fairly restricted, very much based on what Bunting discovered and what he produced in, in his um, different volumes. That's, if, you're, if you're interested in that area, you, you will find it. And um, people who came after Bunting, um, particularly later in the 19th century, who discussed Bunting's theories about gap scales or whatever. Um, so what I'm really looking at is um, examining the periodicals, that was the magazines of the time, not newspaper press, um, monthly, fortnightly, quarterly sometimes, and um, occasionally weekly magazines, what existed, and what had they to say about <coughs> the Harp Festival in Belfast, if anything, or the efforts to revive the Harp in, in Belfast and in Dublin in particular by setting up Harp schools. Um, the, the periodicals of the time, which uh, existed uh, from 1770, there was one a magazine called Walker's Hibernian Magazine. But that was very much based on a, the English style of the salary and didn't really report too much on Irish events. <coughs> um, after the Act of Union, funny enough, the Irish folks suddenly hit the, the stage as such because pre-1800, people who read magazines as such were the gentry, not the normal Irish. And it looked like the national schools weren't introduced until the 1830s. So there were actually the liter literacy skills throughout the country were very slight. So you're really talking about the more intellectually minded people or people who, who, um, who were, were like Beaufort and, and Joseph Cooper Walker, people who actually had a chance for education and were trying to progress the country. So I'm, this is all a preamble to what I'm getting into, which will be, it, it, it will be kind of semi-read and trying to remember things so it won't be quite as exciting as listening to you. <coughs> but it's, as I say, it's a background. You can imagine that as you're, you're dying to know what, does, what had the press to say after the event. Following the Act of Union in 1800, new magazines came into being by the end of the first decade. And for a brief period, we had, between 1807 and 1809, the Cyclopedia magazine. Walter Cox produced the Irish magazine between 1807 and 1815, and the monthly Pantheon arrived 1808 and survived for a year till November 1809. In January 1810, the Hibernian magazine and the monthly Panorama were founded, but they lasted as separate magazines for a very short time, and by July they merged to be one and survived for another 12 months. In 1813, the monthly museum and came to life, but again only last a year, lasted a year. And they were all Dublin based, and in Belfast, where you expect to be a lot of activity, there was one magazine that survived <coughs> over this time between 1808 and 1814, the Belfast Monthly Magazine. Now, th just generally, the magazine, uh, the periodical production was um, very sporadic. I'm not saying the work to others, these are the ones I've examined, or these are the ones where I've found reference to music. So there were literary magazines which took off, but they actually didn't talk about music. What happened in England was they began to produce music-only magazines, but it was uh, 18, almost 1879 before the Irish Pure Music magazine came into being, and that was actually church music, 
Sicilian, the Sicilian movement, and when that died, there was actually nothing until nearly 1916, 1917, as in, well, there was one for one year, um, 1903, but that it was actually very sporadic, and it really was a case of when I went looking for magazines, it was looking at anything and everything, who was saying what about music. But there were, for this period, which as you will you realise from the dates, it coincided with the foundation of the Belfast Harp Society and soon after the Dublin Harp Society. Um, so in order to give you a flavour of the magazine articles themselves, I've included numerous quotations. I don't have any displays, so it'll all be with my voice, okay? And uh, some of them have come in as full paragraphs and others just I've tried to interweave the, the quotations into my general narrative just to keep, give you a flavour, as I say, basically, what, what was going on and what, you, what was people's reaction to the foundation, or even why the societies were founded. So, we're looking at the preservation of the Irish harp and the preservation of the Irish tunes as my general theme, as recorded in the, in the magazines. While, early, or while occasional references were made in the early miscellanies to the Irish harpers and to the harp and bagpipes as the national instruments, the foundation of the harp societies in Belfast and Dublin in 1808 and 1809 created more excitement in the journals than any other single musical activity. These were established for the purpose of preserving the Irish harp and the ancient music which, with which it was associated, while at the same time, in an age when the magazines reflected a new emphasis on religion and morals, allowing generous and enlightened members of the community to tend to their religious duties by contributing to a benevolent, benevolent cause. Reports of similar uh, movements abroad gave status to the fundraising activities associated with the Irish Harp Societies, ensuring their recognition as fashionable ventures and socially acceptable pursuits. For example, in Wales they were beginning to revive the Eisted Fund. And also around this time, which would bring us to the Irish Harpers, um, they were beginning to set up schools for the blind. In France, it was the first school for the blind was set up in 1784, in Liverpool in England 1791, and there are others, I haven't all the dates here, but just it, it coincides so that it wasn't just a venture just to preserve the harp, there were actually other reasons. And we're talking religious, of course at that time it was pre-Catholic emancipation, so you're looking more at the Protestant religion, uh, getting very moralistic and trying to do good, um, because as I said, the Irish normal peasantry really didn't feature too much at that time, and, and certainly not in the magazines. Now, I'll speak about the Belfast Harp Society and how that was viewed in the press. The institution of the Belfast Harp Society in 1808 was first documented in peri periodical literature by way of an advertisement drafted by the committee. This appeared in the Cyclopedia magazine in July 1808 and in the monthly Panorama the following October, at which time it was prefaced by a note from the editor who applauded the spirit of patriotism and liberality which had animated the inhabitants of Belfast and recommended that they be assisted by every person of taste, and by all who felt the love of country glow in their bosoms. And I quote, to every person capable of feeling the influence of patriotism, the preservation of his national music must be a subject of interest. From remote antiquity has Ireland been celebrated in a high degree for the excellence of its bards, for the sweet simplicity and pathos of their poetry, and their superiority on the harp. Impressed with these reflections and regretting that neglect and decay which the harp has latterly experienced, a number of the inhabitants of the town and neighbourhood of Belfast have associated for the purpose of rescuing our national instrument from total extinction. So these, these um, advertisements were sent out and they appeared, and um, what I have discovered them, in two Dublin magazines. The advertisement has confirmed that the proponents of the new society sought to galvanise the support of their compatriots in a righteous way. The provision of music education for selected members of the native population, like that was quite uh, far reaching because there was no music education. Um, so it, it actually is quite important, quite significant. It was their intention to open a subscription to provide instruction for such persons as seem to be highly endowed with natural musical talents who would be sought among the habitations of the poor. If sufficient contributions were forthcoming, the charitable work could be extended beyond the mere business of tuition by giving premiums and support to those of the pupils who were likely to attain eminence in their profession. Harper Arthur O'Neill, a man whose character and talents qualified him highly for the employment and the only person deemed capable of teaching the instrument, had been engaged as teacher. 
and I quote, the society are aware that they have engaged in an arduous undertaking, but they have been excited and almost hurried into the measure by a circumstance melancholy to reflect upon, that the person whom they have been so fortunate as to procure for a master is already far advanced in life, and is, is the only person they know now living in the kingdom capable of that office, and that should anything retard the speedy execution of the project, any future attempt must necessarily prove abortive. For in such an event, our national music must be irrevocably lost, and the, higher, the Irish harp remain unstrung forever. Mm -hmm. The initial success of the new organisation in Belfast was documented in an account of the first annual dinner held the following St. Patrick's Day, that's March 2009, published in the Cyclopedia magazine. The report outlined how, in the course of the evening, eight blind boys, supported, clothed, and instructed on the harp by the society, had performed with their teacher, Arthur O'Neill. The Belfast Monthly Magazine, which had celebrate the, celebrated the foundation of the Harp Society in verse in December 1808, and that there was no articles, it was just a few poems actually turned up. They also recorded the event by publishing verses written for the annual meeting of the Society for Reviving the Irish Harp. And I quote, O minstrels who on Erin's shore prepare to strike the harp once more, and soon will pour your simple lays as did the bards of other days. When useful bards the chord you sweep, then the patriot oft will weep. <laughs> and there's lots more. The text for a duet performed at the dinner, sung to an old Irish air of Kitty Tyrrell, was also published. So these are kind of interesting um, historical uh, things to be found in, in the, the periodicals because there are other references to that particular tune being performed, but the, the fact that the Belfast Monthly Magazine actually has the text of that, that poem is interesting, of, of Kitty, the one to which Kitty turns that. And um, it was sung by, I said, two amateurs, duet and two amateurs. Now, the, the Irish Harp Society, as distinct from the Belfast. In July 1809, Watty Cox's Irish Magazine was the first journal to announce the institution of the Irish Harp Society, a venture based on that of Belfast, spearheaded by General Valancey and a number of eminent Dublin citizens, including John Bernard Trotter. He was quite significant, so I don't know if you've come across him yet. I quote, Belfast has, with a degree of feeling and spirit most honourable to it, established a school for the revival and preservation of Irish music and for the Irish harp. There, the young blind pupil now receives instruction, and charity, taste, and patriotism are at once blended and promoted. Shall Dublin, the metropolis of Ireland, not profit by the example, <laughs> and also stretch forth a hand to misery, while the harp of Erin may be rescued from impending oblivion and decay? End of quote. A detailed account of the Dublin Association, founded on the true basis of charity, taste, and patriotism, was published in the monthly Pantheon in August 1809. Patrick Quinn, a harper from Portadown, was named as teacher, and subscriptions were sought for the patriotic and benevolent institution. A letter sent to the Duke of Redmond to explain the nature of the institution was published in the journal the following November. I quote, Having learned that in Belfast a society for restoring the Irish harp had been established, and that the music of Ireland was thus likely to be in some degree rescued from oblivion, and conceiving that the instrument for which the old and beautiful airs of the Irish music had been composed, and on which they had been played with the happiest effect, ought not, by lovers of music and friends to humanity and Ireland, be permitted to sink into decay, resolved to establish a permanent institution for the interesting purpose of the, in the metropolis of Ireland. End of quote. Now, all this about preserving and um, pre uh, preventing the tunes or the instrument um, falling into total decay or um, um, <coughs> the... Uh, sorry, I've probably gone too quick in my own head. The, the idea of that, say, Bunting came along and he was actually the guy who preserved it all, who prevented the loss of everything. That had come through in the advertisements which had appeared, I'm sure you come across them, in 1792 for the Harp Festival. But the Harp Festival, interestingly enough, was never covered in the periodicals of the time. It was only in the newspaper press. The main magazine of the time was the one I mentioned, Walker Hibernian Magazine. The, one of the contributors who would have written on, on Irish music and early Irish music in particular was Joseph Cooper Walker. But in 1792, he happened to be in Italy. So there was actually nobody around to write about it. 
So it is very interesting that it was only with the establishment of the Dublin Harp Society, not even the Belfast, but the Dublin Harp Society, that the Irish periodicals began to make reference to the Belfast Harp Festival held over a decade earlier. This event was brought to the reader's attention in a letter published in the <coughs> Belfast Monthly Magazine in September 1809, at the time when the Dublin Harp Society was receiving great publicity. But let it never be forgotten, the writer reminded the readers, that Belfast led the way, and I quote, that from her bosom emanated the generous warmth which has recalled to animated existence the famed genius of Irish melody, so long, so shamefully torpid. That in Belfast, the first meeting of the Irish harpers, procured by the inhabitants at considerable expense, took place in the year 1792. That bunting of Belfast, whose musical talents are universally admired, was the first to rescue the fast fading relics of our tuneful bards from threatening oblivion, and to give the world a complete collection of celebrated and original airs. And finally, that the first society for diffusing a knowledge of the harp and perpetuating our national music was instituted in Belfast. So this guy obviously wasn't too happy that Dublin was getting all the publicity and Belfast had been left out. But it, it was the first time that Belfast Harp Festival got mentioned. Now, I'm not promising that you won't go and find a, an obscure magazine adding up in the Dead Sea, but certainly nothing has come to the front before to talk about this. The ongoing development of the Harp Societies was a source of interest to the journal editors. The Irish magazine recorded a dinner held in O'Neill's Hotel in Belfast in Bunting's honour in December 1809, during which Arthur O'Neill and his blind student harpists now increased in number to 19, performed. At this celebration, Bunting, who had earlier in the year published his second collection of the ancient airs, was commended for his efforts in rescuing from oblivion the few relics of our national music, which had escaped the devastation of time. That was the quote I was looking for earlier. But though it, we read a lot about Bunting being given the honor of rescuing from oblivion, that actually was part of the remit of the Belfast Harp Festival. It happened to be Bunting, the 19-year-old who was hired in literally to write down the tunes, but it wasn't Bunting's idea to rescue from oblivion. And you will find it in the, in the advertisements that were sent out in the newspaper press prior to the Belfast Harp Festival. Of course, Ben, needless to say, Bunting used it himself later on, <laughs> loads of times. Further details of Bunting's endeavours were provided in a footnote to this article, which informed the reader that Bunting commenced his researches early in 1792 and collected some music as well as some performance for the harp meeting held in July 1792, which wasn't totally accurate. Early in 1800, again the date's not accurate, and I'm quoting from the magazine, he published, with an appropriate preface, a collection of 66 errors. He has continued his labours till this time and has just published a volume in the most splendid style of any similar work that has ever appeared in the United Kingdom. End of quotation. So the, the 1800 actually should have been 1796, but as I said, this will again is historically important because it's the first time it gets mentioned. And of interest also is that both antiquarians and the art musicians of the time were united in promoting the art societies. It was not a fringe event. You know, the musicians of the time were behind it. And those who commented upon its activities were in agreement that failure to protect the ancient Irish instrument would result in its extinction and the subsequent loss of the native music. The monthly pantheon recorded a, few, a number of <coughs> interesting events, including an Irish concert composed of ancient Irish airs as perfect in conception and effect as it was in execution. Billed as the commemoration of Carolyn, the title, according to the monthly pantheon, proposed for the occasion by Joseph Cooper Walker, found its origin in the commemoration of Handel concerts held in London from 1784 onwards and in Dublin during 1786 and 1788. So they took what had been very important, I say, art music concerts, commemoration of Handel, and Joseph Cooper Walker, who, as I'm sure you're aware, who wrote the historical memoirs of the Irish bards or collected the essays that became that, he actually had the idea, that's called the Dublin of the Commemoration of Carola. The venue chosen for the commemoration of the Irish Bard was a fashionable private theatre in Fishamble Street, next to, pre to um, Siobhan's information there. Uh, in the early 1780s, what had been O'Neill's music house was actually turned into a theatre, and it became a national theatre for a short time. It closed up again, it became a private theatre, as in where the gentry went when the normal mob began to go to the public theatre. Closed down again, and then around this time, it was reopened by Mr. Campbell, 
who gave, gave the venue as a present to the Harp Society. The performance in which all the prominent city musicians participated without fee or reward took place on September the 20th, 1809. And I quote, the old Irish music given on that occasion, the arrangements of Sir John Stevenson, Mr. Cook, and Mr. Logier, the performance of Mrs. Cook, Miss William, Willman, and the Mrs. Cheeses, Mr. Spray, and a capital instrumental band had such a wonderful effect that a repetition of Carolyn's first commemoration was demanded at the Rotunda. This um, was uh, this quotation taken from the Hibernia magazine, not the Hibernia, the Hibernia of 1810. And th both concerts were, were recorded in the Hibernia, but also in the most sardonic publication of the time, the Dublin Satirist, which declared that it, it would be cruel as well as unmanly and malignant to censure an institution, the object of which was harmless, if not praiseworthy. According to the Dublin satirist, the house is well attended and the audience hastens to hear and see the venerable Paddy Quinn, the antiquity of whose instruments inspired the descendants of the Norwegians with enthusiasm. The second concert took place a week later at the Rotunda. According, according to a letter published in the Hibernian magazine in January, 19, sorry, January 1810, was, if possible, superior to the first. With the exception of the old drunken harper, who was most successful in murdering some of our Irish national heirs. <laughs> <laughs> the Dublin satirist described the splendidly illuminated room and the efforts made by the organisers to prove their loyalty to the kingdom. And I quote, and crown of coloured lamps with the motto, God save the king, in letters of gold, in front of the organ, might have dispelled any gloomy doubt of the loyalty of the Irish Harp Society, had not the secretary, I think Trotter, most injudiciously displayed a new green coat. <laughs> it is much to be regretted that the melody of the Irish harp, as called forth by the sharp nails of the venerable Paddy Quinn, was in some degree lost to the audience, whose auricular nerves had been so violently assailed and stunned by the drums, clarionets, and horns of Tommy Cook that the vibratory sounds of the brass wire were scarcely heard. And of course, for those who don't know, Tom Cook was the, the leader of the orchestra, the theatre orchestra. The progress of the Irish Harp Society was also documented in the more conservative journal, Walker's Hibernian Magazine. And, and that's nothing to do with Joseph Cooper Walker, to be a different family. Which re it reported in 1809 that there were three blind pupils supported at the society's expense in a house in Glasnevin, presented to the Irish Harp Society by the Lord Bishop of Kildare. The journals with a more nationalistic voice recorded the political significance and implications of the Harp Societies. In August 1809, the editor of the monthly Pantheon, a journal which preserved more reports of the Irish Harp Society than any other journal of the time, was optimistic that the song of the Bard would create a new harmony and would again soothe the soul of sensibility. I quote, It will call back memory to the contemplation of departed genius and while it descends to posterity as a record of our early civilization, it will tend to harmonize those jarring effects which too frequently disturb even the best regulated nations. End quote. <coughs> Watty Cox, proprietor of the Irish magazine, published a report in July 1809 in which he considered the revival in the light of nationalistic retribution. He praised the people of Belfast for taking the harp from its hiding place and thereby keeping alive the taste and remembrance of Irish music which the occupiers had attempted to eradicate. I think Lotte Cox is one of the extremists. But he did manage his own magazine for five, uh, from um, 1807 to 1814, 1815, pretty much by himself. Uh, but I think some of it he was in jail. <laughs> he wrote it for his nationalistic uh, attitude. But um, it's still, it's, it's interesting to read, um, to read his magazine. Actually, the very first article he had is slightly diverse. The very first article he had was a member of Carolyn. The very first to put it. A member of Patrick Quinn, published in the monthly Pantheon in October 1809, confirmed that although the ambitious, ambitious proposals put forward by the Dublin Committee to revive the ancient airs and instruments had received support from many sectors of society, the political significance of the enterprise made it unacceptable to some of the city's most influential citizens. I quote. The revival of the Irish harp has excited much observation in Dublin and its vicinity. The advocates for it and the enemies to it have not been sparing of eulogium or reprehension. 
The one has said that to restore the music and the peculiar instrument of Ireland, sanctions as they were by past ages, was not only laudable as an undertaking promoting charity and civilization of manners, it was an act of mingled piety and patriotism. Its enemies, and they have been but few, behold in the harp a symbol of sedition. Surely in these enlightened times we are not openly to be told that music is dangerous and its instruments seditious. End of quote. As secretary of the Irish Harp Society, Trotter had written to the Lord Lieutenant, the Duke of Richmond, in, in July 1809, outlining the objects and views of the organisation and seeking his support and patronage. With no reply forthcoming, the editor of the Monthly Pantheon sought to reassure his readership of the noble, moral and honourable aspirations of the venture. And I quote, the Irish Harp Society promised to leave to their country a memorial of their veneration for its music and an asylum for the blind. If a jaundiced eye beholds in this institution a gleam of conspiracy or the depository of sedition, the diseased state of the organ is to be lamented. The gospel itself, thus tortured and misrepresented, might be decried as republican and suppressed as dangerous. The apparent stagnation of the Harp Society in Dublin was an issue of concern to a correspondent in the Hibernian magazine who, within six months of its inauguration, queried the status of the funds raised, deemed to be sufficient to establish a school with at least 20 pupils, who ought by this time be nearly able to earn their bread. The following August, the same journal referred to a committee of the society members held, sorry, the committee meeting of the society members held for the purpose of electing it. Committee of Music and Literature. And after that, no more mention. Until October 1811, when Wattie Cox's Irish magazine reprinted an excerpt from a newspaper announcing the demise of the Irish Harp Society. Uh, I haven't gone looking into the, the newspaper, so if anybody wants a project, you can find out what newspaper said the following. I quote, the songs of our ancient bards have long been banished from our national memories by our me melodies, by our English rulers, and to revive them would be only rec recapitulating sufferings that could have no other tendency but to disturb by one harmony the other harmony that exists between the Irish and their English brethren. This seasonable and loyal extinction of our harp society was, was agreed on after mature deliberation and to the credit of the managers unanimously. What actually happened was the money was handed over to the blind institution, and that was the end of Dublin Harp Society. In Belfast, uh, the Harp Society survived for another six years. Um, there is, I don't know if you've come across the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, in the 1890s, 1895, there are two or three important articles, which I had at my beginning of my paper and then I skipped over. Um, Robert Young contributed a few papers. One on the Irish Harp was in Belfast in 1792, but that did not appear until 1895. And um, Francis Joseph Bigger uh, contributed <coughs> Arthur O'Neill's biography and the Quinn's in 1901 and 1905. That's the journal, uh, sorry, Ulster Journal of Archaeology, which uh, as I said, almost 100 years passed before the information arrived. But Bigger, citing Bunting's account, which we, would be from his 1840 collection, he recorded in the Ulster Journal that O'Neill retired to Dungannon and continued to receive an annual stipend of £30 from the Belfast Harp Society until his death in 1818. The new Irish Harp Society was revived in Belfast with financial support from India in April 1819 with Edward McBride as teacher. He was succeeded in 1823 by Valentine Rennie, continued until 1837. James Jackson was teacher from 1838 to 39, at which time the funds were depleted, the society finally closed its doors. And you will find us in more detailed information in the Ulster uh, magazine. I have been trying to look at what happened earlier because um, the, the late 19th century periodicals would be fairly well known. They're in the, common, um, in the public domain and more accessible also on the library shelves. You find a lot of these magazines, the National Library, the Royal Irish Academy. I did a lot of my research in UCD, and of course Trinity. But the Royal Irish Academy is pretty good also. So if you're interested in finding the articles for yourself, they can all be there. Now, the next section I'm going to speak about is the preservation of the heirs. As I've already observed, no mention was made of the Belfast Harp Festival of 1792 in the periodical publication until 1809. 
Neither did any review of Bunting's 1796 collection appear. It was the effort to preserve the ancient Irish heirs by reclothing them with texts which finally brought attention to the heirs themselves. These efforts commenced in 1805 with the publication of Sidney Olmson's 12 Hibernian Melodies with words translated from the most celebrated Irish bards. This new publication was listed in a section devoted to new music in Dublin in the first issue of the Encyclopedia magazine in January 1807. And that's about it, just one mention. You can actually get those 12 Hibernian Melodies and I think they're on the internet. It's amazing that's available nowadays. In 1806, the brothers James and William Parr conceived the idea of publishing a collection of Irish melodies in the style of George Thompson's Scottish collection. So Thompson over in Scotland was collecting melodies and then hiring in a few odd composers, you know, the likes of Beethoven or Haydn, who happened around, and paying him to write new accompaniments. So the two Parr brothers thought, let's do it in Dublin. The task of providing accompaniments and symphonies was assigned to Sir John Stevenson who in turn suggested Thomas Moore as poet. In an effort to advertise a new production, a biography of Stevenson was published in the Cyclopedian magazine in April 1807. I quote, Ever attentive to his professional pursuits and doubtless of that fame which is connected with national character, E. Stevenson, is at present engaged in a work which bids fair to add considerably to the rising reputation of Irish music and Irish literature. His coadjutor in this undertaking is Mr. Moore, the anacreontic style and spirit of whose poetic confusions have been so greatly admired. Again, historically important, did Moore go to Stevenson? Did Stevenson go to Moore? Why was it Moore? I think from what I've read that basically the intention was to use different poets, but Moore was so successful at the beginning that they stuck with him. It was Stevenson who was actually pushed sideways later on. <coughs> and it was a bishop that put some of the later accompanies. A letter from Thomas Moore, written in reply to an invitation from Stevenson to adapt words to existing Irish heirs, was published with the memoir. Moore outlined the difficulties that would arise in adapting words to the ancient melodies due to the irregular structure of many of those heirs and the lawless kind of meter. However, he was enthusiastic that such a work could be undertaken. I quote. Now these are Moore's words. I think they appear in Bunting's biography that George Petrie contributed to the Dublin University magazine in 1847. Perhaps not the complete letter, but certainly part of the letter is there. I quote, We have too long neglected the only talent for which our English neighbours ever deigned to allow us any credit. Our national music has never been properly collected, and while the composers of, of the continent have enriched their operas and sonatas with melodies borrowed from Ireland, very often, without even the honesty of acknowledgement, we have left those treasures in a great degree unclaimed and fugitive. Thus our heirs, like too many of our countrymen, for want of protection at home, have passed into the service of foreigners. <laughs> Moore's letter confirms Stevens's role in suggesting this poet, so I continue the quote. The task that you sorry, the task which you propose to me of adapting words to these heirs is by no means easy. The poet who would follow the various sentiments which they express must feel and understand that rapid fluctuation of spirits, that unaccountable mixture of gloom and levity which composes the character of the Irish and has deeply tinged their music. End of quote. Though not a highly trained musician, Moore had, a decade earlier, while a student in Trinity College, been instinctively drawn to the high quality of the native melodies published in Bunting's collection of 1796. His first encounter with the ancient heirs was recorded in the Dublin University magazine in the same article to which I've just referred, the biography of Bunting by George Petrie. I quote, It was in the year 1797 that, through the medium of Mr. Bunting's book, I was first made acquainted with the beauties of our native music. A young friend of our family, Edward Hulkson, who played with much taste and feeling on the flute, was the first who made known to me this rich mine of our country's melodies, a mine from the working of which my humble labours as a poet have since then derived their sole lustre and value. This letter of, uh, these words of, of Moore actually first appeared in the preface to the fourth volume of complete works. I think that was 1820s. <coughs> so that's, but it was reprinted. And I'm dealing, remember, I'm dealing with what actually had turned up in the periodicals. But I tried to 
find side of us where, where they actually came from. But um, to be fair to Moore, he gave full credit to Bunting's early collection as having inspired him. Moore had drafted a preface intended to, to accompany the first number of his Irish melodies in 1807, in which he justified his decision to look to Ireland's heroic past for his poetic themes, identifying those times when the native monarchs of Ireland displayed and fostered virtues worthy of a better age, as the only period which reflected the traits of heroism which a poet could venture to commemorate in verse with safety to himself or perhaps with honour to the country. This was suppressed before publication. I think it was, a, it was deemed to be too political. But it appeared as a suppressed um, preface in the Dublin Examiner magazine which lasted for one year during 1816 to May, January 1817. No critiques of the early numbers of the Irish melodies appeared in the journals. The first indication that Moore's collaboration with Stevenson had brought him fame appeared in the Cyclopedian magazine in December 1808. So it was during 1807 and 1808, the first two. Um, numbers of the Moore's melodies appeared. And in the Cyclopedian magazine, verses penned by Joseph Atkinson in celebration of the series of private theatricals held, interestingly enough, in Kilkenny in eight, October 1808 were printed. And I quote, it was during 1807 and 1808 the first two um, numbers of the Moore's melodies appeared. And in the Cyclopedian over a year later, a letter from Bunting dated April, April 1810 was published in the monthly Panorama. And that was one of the two magazines which <coughs> commenced publication in January 1810. In this, he clarified some of the editorial decisions he had taken when preparing his recent volume for publication. In particular, his decision to set the years adapted for voice in low keys. He stated that his original publication brought out 13 years earlier had been intended as the beginning of a series which was to embrace the entire body of the music of his native country. This quote I'm going to take now is actually from this letter. This is literally um, Bunting sitting around, not happy with what was going on, and writing to the press. Now, this is really far from being happy, which is quite interesting, fascinating to discover 200 years later. I quote, Whenever, sorry, whatever were the merits or defects of that first attempt in the year 1796, Sir John Stevenson, of whom you speak, introduced several years afterwards no less than 11 of its heirs in the first volume of his melodies, which contained, in all, only five more. It is far from my wish to depreciate any attempt to extend the knowledge of Irish music in whatever form it appears. I must, however, be suffered to say what is obvious on the face of our respective works, that they move in different spheres and aim at different objects. One of these consists of tunes generally known in Great Britain and Ireland, forming a selection which a naval musician could produce in his elbow chair. The other is a collection which embraces similar objects, with the advantage of having every well-authenticated, valuable, and really ancient melody that could be restored by the active exertions of almost my lifetime, a collection which at this period it is out of my power, sorry, it is out of the power of any other person to make. End of quote. And of course, a reply was immediately forthcoming from William Power, one of the publishers. And it appeared in the July issue of the Hibernian magazine and the monthly panorama. So if you're looking for these, I said, because two magazines began independently, it took me a while before I actually located the follow-up because of, of the, 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 just the way that the publication word went. In this, in his letter, in his reply, um, Power admonished Bunting for devaluing the work which Moore and Stevens had, Stevenson had given to the world, and for questioning their right to employ their talents upon any air which he himself had taken the trouble of noting down during his painful preambulations among the pipers. I quote Power's words. Really, sir, to hear Mr. Bunting speak, one would suppose that the rich stream of Irish music was like that celebrated river, Chaospes, in Persia, of whose waters only one pair of privileged lips might taste. But this monopolizing editor must bear to be told that the wild warblings of national song are as common property as the air through which they float, that we have just as much right to these Irish diamonds as himself, and that the tasteless workmanship of the setting is all he can exclusively call his own. Oh. Oh. Yes, Mr. Farr. In September 1810, 
bunting retort, declaring that Parr was culpable of indecent plagiarism. As his editor had <laughs> pilfered from the collector's unfinished work, protesting that he himself was faithful in preserving accurately the original melodies, Bunting, Bunting contrasted his ancient airs, fruits of long and active research, in those obscure retreats where time has least impaired the original strains, with the Dublin Irish melodies, oh. as Mr. Powers are called, oh. which had hitherto consisted of a few common airs in everyone's knowledge tricked out in perishable, unappropriate organs. And I quote, the fact is, Mr. Power's melodies of Ireland are twisted and turned, rawr drawn and curtailed at will to answer the words of a poet, while my general collection of the music of Ireland uses the poetry merely as a vehicle of and subservient to strings. For those who are interested in all the sources, um, there's a, an article that appeared in 1957 and the second one, then 1959, um, in the, the, the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland um, by uh, Ronvini Kineda, in which she tried to find the sources of all of all the different volumes of those melodies, which makes interesting reading. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar also with Alice Fleischmann's Sources of Irish Traditional Music, which actually traces the tunes back even further. So if you wanted to follow that line, it's interesting to see. But certainly there's no doubt there were a few um, tunes like Rome, Green Molly, which I think something became the heart that once mm -hmm. got them mixed up. But there were some tunes that had been sung regularly in the in the theatre. And I have found lots of references to them as theatre music, even in London, not just in Dublin. The dispute of voting made it more difficult for more to procure to procure errors which equaled the richness and novelty of the early publications. In February 1814, the Monthly Museum reviewed the fifth number of Moore's melodies, giving a detailed commentary on each song. The writer was critical of Moore's use of hackneyed airs and suggested that his poetry suffered when he was obliged to distort his lines to make them answer an uncouth air. <laughs> the critic was, however, astute in recognising the airs that would survive the test of time. And this is a quote from, from the review. "'Tis the last rose of summer has a gleam of Mr. Moore's ancient fire." A wild strain of melody pervades the entire of the air, which he has seized in the best manner. The minstrel boy, it is impossible for us to do justice to the beauty of the lines, the tearing chords asunder, that they might never sound in slavery, is consonant with the feelings that pervades the, first, the three first numbers of this work, and makes us grieve the more from seeing such so seldom. I think in time there was, peace was made, I'd say, between bunting and more and Moore's a publisher from London in particular. And uh, as time went on, more, more of Bunting, especially I think the 1809 collection, began to, began to be used by Moore, with, with permission this time. <laughs> Following the publication of Bunting's collection in 1840, the native areas almost disappeared from the periodical uh, literature as an area of debate. It's interesting, we would expect that having Bunting having brought so many more to, to the fore and then later on in the 1850s, Petrie, that it would have become an area of debate. But in actual fact, it disappeared. And that was a partly to the fact that these magazines, as the ones I have just mentioned, were all in the first decade and a half or so. Very little happened in the 1820s. Um, 1831, what's interesting is the National School of um, Education, but of course no Irish to talk in the school. And what, in order to kind of improve literacy, the magazines changed from being what we look at more literary magazine to being the penny journals. And the penny journals had the occasional music related article, very open about the bards, um, but short snippets. And um, the idea of a debate pretty much disappeared. But I, I know I'm almost gone on time here, so I'll try and just catch up with a few things. Of interest to you, you may have come across the Citizen magazine, which can commenced publication of its own series of the native music of Ireland in 1841. Um, William Elliot Hudson was actually a first cousin of Edward Hudson, who played the flute so beautifully that um, Moore heard him, hear him, him play the tunes way back in, 18, in 1797 in Trinity. So it's interesting. Um, and he was the founder of that citizen magazine. The, the heirs are published and edited by William Elliot's brother, Henry. Um, they didn't appear in the, in the beginning. 1839, there was nothing. 1840, there was an article on, on the ancient music of Ireland, which was actually a review of Bunting's 1840 volume. 
And then from 1841 to 1843, airs published very regularly. Most of these appeared with English texts and were arranged for voice and piano, did not the unadulterated air at all. Some, were some deemed to have originated as instrumental pieces were published for violin and with piano accompaniment. And even more interesting, as the temperance bands were encouraged to incorporate Irish melodies into their performances, the Dublin Monthly Magazine of 1842, which was a continuation of the Citizen, magazines kept going sometimes with new names, but it, it supported the national temperance movement by publishing arrangements composed by the violinist James Barton. So the Irish tunes, you can actually find them, if, I'm sure they're in the Royal Irish Academy, probably in the National Library, you can actually get arrangements of the Irish airs made by James Barton, who was probably at that point the leader of the orchestra in the theatre in Dublin. This magazine also reported, again you may be aware of this, that in Drogheda, the members of the Total Abstinence Society were so motivated to promote the Irish airs that they formed a harp society for which they made their own instruments. So that's a, say, a continuation of the Citizen of the Dublin Monthly Magazine. Many of the references which appeared in the journals in the latter half of the century reports, were reports of lecture recitals of Irish music which took place in London, rather than, as I say, debate on the Irish side. Airs sung to Irish texts were part of the lecture on national music of Ireland with vocal and instrumental illustrations presented by Mr. Frederick Horncastle in London in January 1843. This entertainment, for which the complete programme was published in another continuation of the system called the Dublin Magazine, just basic Dublin Magazine, 1843. It was, in reality, a historical survey of the music of Ireland interspersed with native airs, including some of Moore's melodies, performed with harp or piano accompaniment, and instrumental pieces played by on the Union pipes. So really, as I say, the news of what happened in London filtered back to Ireland, rather than the other way around. And such interest was created in that concert that it was immediately repeated in the, a month later, in Mr. Classen's Music Hall in Abbey Street, which is now where the Abbey Theatre is. But that was a, a 4,000 seater music hall on stage. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what you learn when you go read the Abbey Periodicals. Following the establishment of the national schools in 1831 and the ravages of the famine in the 1840s, Irish gradually disappeared as a spoken language among the natives. A writer in the Irish Quarterly Review, now this was quite a, a scholarly magazine, um, in 1854, he regretted that since the famine, he had not heard the peasants singing as formerly their Irish songs while they held the plough or followed their carts. He contrasted the situation which had formerly existed in Irish and universities spoken among the rustics to that of the present time. Now, in the same districts, Irish speakers are rare. 1850s. Sad. With the school curriculum which came, into which no national areas had been incorporated, Irish children became more and more removed from the country's traditional music and culture. The Celt, a very nationalistic journal published between 1857 and 1859, remarked that the singing of a native air had become a thing bespeaking almost the total want of a gentlemanly education. This was confirmed in 1911 by Father Edward Gaynor, he was a priest who contributed a lot to choral music in Cork. He even had a Palestrina choir in Cork around the turn of the century. Or probably earlier, he was born, he was born in the 1850s and reminiscing about his own childhood, he recorded that as people became more educated, the airs which had played, sorry, the airs which had played such an important part in nurturing his own musical talent and that of generations of native Irish children before him were no longer held in respect and were replaced not by cultivated art music, but by songs borrowed from the music halls. I quote, this is from 1911, the place became lettered and the music is lost. The people now read the papers and sing Kelly and Yippie Yaddy. And if anyone was heard humming one of the old strains, he'd be mockingly asked, is that the tune the old cow died of? <laughs> if that neighborhood had continued as remote and as illiterate as before, and if we had all lived out our lives there in the old way, doubtless we would have handed on those old airs exactly as we received them. In 1865, the editor of the Saturday magazine commented upon the fact that Irish music had not featured as part of the opening concert for the Dublin exhibition. This lack of Irish music in concert programs was also the concern of the contributor to the Irish Builder in 1873. Uh, the, the Saturday magazine was a bit like a penny journal, a bit more sophisticated. And then uh, the, uh, the reporting on music actually shifted from literary magazines 
symptoms into scientific magazines, and in this case, the Builder, Builder's Magazine, the Arch Builder, which would report a lot about church building and organs they installed. Uh, <coughs> it's, it, it's, 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 anyway, uh, and you're nearly, nearly <coughs> right. This right referred to what had passed to what passed as musical fair in Dublin as a medley of or wretched farrago of all that was senseless, saddening, and servile. I quote, we have a national music, ancient and modern, sufficient to rise the most lethargic natives, but why is not some noble or honest attempt made to give it expression consonant with national desires and feelings? Over the following decades, articles which related to the national music appeared occasionally. During 1874, Ireland's Eye broke to public notice a number of concerts of Irish music organised in celebration of Moore's birth night. The Dublin Journal published an essay by Edmund Russell on the National Music of Ireland in 1887, and in 1890, Barry Ecclesiastica, the journal I referred to earlier, which was of the Irish Sicilian Society, it reprinted over a number of issues a paper on Irish music from the Proceedings of the Musical Association in London which was contributed by one of its members, Frederick St. John Lacey, who was later appointed to the Chair of Music in what was then Queen's University Cork. But that was really what kept Irish music alive, as they either reprinted from abroad or people writing letters from abroad saying, hey, what's going on? Why aren't you actually promoting your own native music as you should be? While these and later discourses on the native areas may have been of interest to the journal readership, it was with the instigation of two national festivals, the Fete Cule and the Eruptus, in 1897, that the native music of Ireland once more found a place in the Irish periodical literature. But that is a discussion for another day. <laughs> Thank you. But um, they, they, it was really because the Harp Society was set up in Dublin that I think he even got mentioned.